Want to find out how different the original book of Stargirl is from the recent Disney Plus movie? I've been reading the book and there are quite a few differences. So let's see just how much Disney has transformed Stargirl. Well, hello there. My name is Jeremy and welcome back to Freeform Disney, where I talk about all aspects of Disney, from the animated movies to the theme parks to Star Wars, Marvel, and Pixar, and the TV shows, and everything else in between. And that is why it's Freeform. And keep coming back every day for new daily content. If you're not subscribed yet, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Now on to today's topic, Transformed by Disney, Stargirl. The movie Stargirl is a Disney Plus movie here in 2020, while the book it is based on was written by Jerry Spinelli and published in 2000, 20 years earlier. Each are set to take place in the year they were released, which means there are going to be some differences off the bat due to changes in culture and technology. As insane as it seems to say this, the first generation iPhone only came out 13 years ago, which means the book is set 7 years before that. That means that all the scenes with smartphones in the movie wouldn't have been able to happen like that in the book. They wouldn't have existed for seven years after the book was published. I mean, dang, technology really does move fast, doesn't it? Now, I also need to note that the book is 186 pages long, and so I won't exhaustively talk about all the differences between the two, as that would take far too long. But even with that, there's still enough to talk about that I'm going to break it out into two different videos. So of the 33 chapters, we're going to do the first 17 today. I'm kind of going to go chronologically, but not entirely. So here we go. We're going to dive right on in. In the book, Leo and his family moved from Pennsylvania to Arizona at the age of 12. While in the movie, he received a tie in Arizona on his ninth birthday. So one assumes eight was when he moved. Now, the next piece feels like a classic Disney move. Because after all, in Disney, you've got to have a dead parent. So in the Disney Plus Stargirl movie, Leo's dad died tragically prior to their move to Arizona. Whereas in the book, well, guess what? Leo's parents are alive. There, there's no problems there. Which also means the tie was not from his dead dad. Actually, in fact, the tie was his uncle's. And Leo always liked the tie, so therefore Uncle Pete went ahead and gave him the deck tie as a going away present. And the changes with the tie don't stop there. Because then, once we get to Arizona, in the movie, there's this giant tie-cutting incident. Huge traumatic experience for Leo. And that's because he doesn't fit in, he's the new kid. And that's also where he met his best friend Kevin. But what about the book? A little bit different. There's no tie-cutting incident. He still loves ties. And there's no talk about him having really stood out as a new kid. No talk about him having to take extra steps to fit in. And, well, he must have met his best friend Kevin in some unwritten, normal way because there's no talk about it. At least not in the first half of the book. So what about Leo getting ties on his birthday? Well, in the book, remember he moved when he was 12? He receives a present on his 14th birthday. And no other talk about having received any presents, so it seems like it was a one-time thing. Whereas in the movie, he received one on his 9th birthday, and then his 10th, and 11th, and 12th, and 13th, etc. In the book, we do have an idea why he goes ahead and gets a tie for his birthday, and how Stargirl figured it out. And that's because the newspaper likes to run a feature on kids whose birthdays are happening, and they put some info in there which says, As a hobby, Leo Borlock collects porcupine neckties. Now that said, while it said Leo Borlock collected porcupine neckties, he was trying to find one and never had actually found any other, so really he had just the one from his Uncle Pete. Now as an interesting note, the porcupine necktie he actually receives in the book is not any of the neckties we see him with in the movie. The one in the book is two porcupines tossing darts with their quills, and then a third one's picking its teeth. How did Leo first see Stargirl? In the movie, he's over a band practice and sees Stargirl off at a distance. That's not what happens in the book, though. In the book, he doesn't meet her ahead of time, ahead of everyone else. The first line in the first chapter of the book is from Kevin to Leo, which is, did you see her? And so then he starts hearing that more and more in the halls, you know, did you see her? Did you see her? And he doesn't run into her in a classroom. 
Because it seems he doesn't necessarily have a class with her at all during the day. He doesn't actually see Stargirl until lunchtime. Quite a bit later right there. And Stargirl, according to the book, she wasn't gorgeous, wasn't ugly. A sprinkle of freckles crossed the bridge of her nose. Mostly, she looked like a hundred other girls in school. Except for two things. She wore no makeup, and her eyes were the biggest I had ever seen. Like deer's eyes caught in headlights. Which apparently gave her a look of constant astonishment, which also affected everybody around her and how they viewed her. Of course, in the movie, we have Grace Vanderwall. Certainly not quite that description right there. And that's no knock against the movie. Just talking about the differences between the two. And remember, Stargirl is really odd, especially in the book. So half the lunchroom was staring at her, half of them started buzzing with her in that room. In the movie, she's not taken much note of, not until she starts singing. And what song does she sing? Well, in the movie, she sings Happy Birthday to Leo because it's Leo's birthday, which we assume is the first day of class. But that's certainly not the case, not even close in the book. Because Leo, well, his birthday is actually during the summer. And in fact, on the first day of classes, which is the first day in the book, we actually see Stargirl go ahead and sing a song where she's singing, I'm looking for a four-leaf clover that I overlooked before. So no happy birthday to anybody on that first day. But that's one of the things we'll see in the book is that she sings every day at lunch, whether it's a happy birthday song or not. And that first day with that first song, eh, there's no giant super happy reaction from everyone. Actually, all we really get is one person who's a lunch line cashier clap a little bit, and that was it. So it takes some time before Stargirl actually gets popular. And Hillary? Hillary is definitely different between the book and the movie. Hillary doesn't like Stargirl from the beginning. She's the most popular girl at the school, and she's got all kinds of theories as to what's going on with Stargirl. And Hillary thinks, oh, she must be a mole from the administration because clearly they're trying to build school spirit. No one could actually be like Stargirl. Heck, later on, Hillary actually holds up Cinnamon over the railing on the second floor, threatening to drop Cinnamon down to the ground. This is how much Hillary doesn't like Stargirl in the book. And it's not because of a bike incident. She just doesn't like Stargirl. Frankly, I like the Hillary of the movie definitely better than the Hillary of the book. She's a much more interesting character, I think. Now, in the book, nonconformity is a major, major point. It's not really so much in the movie, but it's definitely true of the book. The book goes through long descriptions of crazy things she does again and again and again and again throughout the book. And just how different they find Stargirl. Here's one of the things she does. We watched her sit down in class and pull from her canvas bag a blue and yellow ruffled curtain that she draped over three sides of her desk. We saw her set out a three inch clear glass vase and drop into it a white and yellow daisy. She did and undid this in every class she attended six times a day. Only on Monday mornings was the daisy fresh. By last period, the petals were drooping. By Wednesday, the petals began to fall, the stem to sag. And by Friday, the flower hung down over the rim of the waterless vase, its dead stump of a head shedding yellow dust in the pencil groove. Just try to imagine that and picture that. The movie does make a nod to it. There's a little flower in a small glass vase. Other than that, we see no reference to an event like this or some of the other crazy things Stargirl does in the books. What about her clothes? Her clothes are so different. In the movie, we say that she really looks different, but to be honest, it's within a relatively narrow range of what different could be. She's kind of normal different, shall we say. In the book, here's some of the stuff she does. Several times in those early weeks of September, she showed up in something outrageous. A 1920s flapper dress, an Indian buckskin, a kimono, one day she wore a denim miniskirt with green stockings and crawling up one leg was a parade of enamel ladybug and butterfly pins. Normal, for her, were long, floor-brushing pioneer dresses and skirts. Now remember, her mother makes costumes for the theater, so you can see where she's getting all these outfits from. The very first day, she actually came in this long, off-white, wedding dress-looking outfit that Leo described as something that could have been from his grandmother's time period. So when we say she looked different in the book, wow. 
And yet, they still kept trying to put a pin in Stargirl and failing to be able to put any label on her. All they could really get is that she was different. In the book versus the movie, things are played out over a much longer period of time. Now, this isn't a surprise. Movies only have two hours, roughly speaking, and therefore movies always have to condense things down to some degree. Nevertheless, it can be surprising just how much they condense things down. For instance, Halloween was actually part of the romance montage in the movie, whereas in the book, Leo and Stargirl have barely talked at that point. The romance for Leo and Stargirl in the book won't happen until the new year. In the book, the football team sucks. Barely anyone is attending the football game, and therefore, the school keeps talking about shutting it down. In the movie, the football team still gets halfway decent attendance, and there seems to be no talk of the school shutting it down. In fact, these were a couple issues I had with the movie, and where it hurt my ability to suspend my disbelief. But the book actually addresses it and covers it correctly. That's what would happen if your football team was that horrible. Now, while we're talking about the football team, guess what? That marching band? So small, they couldn't even form a letter. Although, even then, this small marching band of like 12 people or so outnumbers the audience watching the game. And Leo? Not part of the marching band at all. Unlike the movie, where him being part of the marching band is something we see a lot of. But he's not there. He doesn't attend the games, as a general note. But his best friend Kevin attends every single game, so he's one of those very, very few in the audience who does it. And they aren't the mud frogs, because they are instead the electrons. Now, this is because of the electronics history of the town, but in the movie, making the mud frogs such a central piece of what we see helps push that whole coming out of hibernation idea. And especially in an area where it's so visual, it's nice to have mud frogs always in our mind. Oh, here's an interesting thing. In the book, Leo actually has to borrow his family's truck whenever he's going out driving, as opposed to his more suburban car he has in the movie. What about Stargirl becoming a cheerleader? Does it happen in the book? Most certainly. In fact, it's an incredibly important part within the book and what happens in the course of all of this. So it comes about because, first off, she shows up to a football game just out of the blue, and her antics are insane. She just keeps going and going and going, in fact, not even letting the players get back on the field because she's still doing all kinds of things all around. But people were really intrigued by her antics, and the word spread all around the town. Even during the game, people were showing up as word started spreading and phone calls were made. This leads to the next game having like a thousand people show up, which is unheard of. But they didn't show up for the football game because nobody cares about that. They showed up to see Stargirl and whatever the heck she might get up to next time. And then she didn't show up. So guess what? A couple days later, head cheerleader sits with her and successfully invites Stargirl to be on the squad. Surprise, surprise. Now, in the movie, because we're using Grace Vanderwall, it's very music-oriented. And there aren't really any other crazy antics to really talk about. It's just Stargirl going out and doing a musical number and singing over on the field to go ahead and boost school spirit. And did Stargirl get the football team to go ahead and start winning? No. In the book, she did not. In fact, the very last football game of the season was her first as a cheerleader, and the team still lost. So there was no, she's our good luck charm, as in the movie, didn't happen. In fact, the major incidents and whatnot happened during the next season, during the basketball season, not the football season. Back to the compressed timeline of the movie versus the book, so we spread things out. The book talks about how by December 1st, Stargirl was actually the most popular kid in school. So things had gone that far, although it took months. But what about her fall from grace? Because that certainly still happens too. It's an interesting pun to make in there. I didn't even intend that, but fall from grace grace, right? Anyway, people start seeing a few things negatively about Stargirl. She says the Pledge of Allegiance weirdly. She goes to a funeral that's not her own. The bike incident does also happen in the book, although it's not Hillary's brother, it's just someone else. And all of those are noted, but they don't really have an immediate effect. They will eventually play into reasons that people don't like Stargirl, though. What really did it? Well, it all comes down heavily, heavily to the basketball season and Stargirl's cheering. So Stargirl considered herself a cheerleader for both sides, for everyone. Early on, people didn't necessarily care as much, but they're not used to winning. They're used to losing. 
in the previous year, their boys basketball team had only won five of its 26 games. But this time, early January, they were up to 10 wins and still no losses, and it started to change the mood of the school. Essentially, they became real sore winners. They were horrible, nasty winners. As the book said, we began to boo. It was our first experience as booers, but you'd have thought we were veterans. We booed the other team. We booed the other coach. We booed the other fans, the referees. Whatever threatened our perfect season, we booed it. We even booed the scoreboard. We hated games that went down to the wire. We hated suspense. We loved games that were decided in the first five minutes. We wanted more than victories. We wanted massacres. The only score we would have been totally happy with would have been 100 to 0. And right there in the middle of it all, in the midst of this perfect season mania, was Stargirl, popping up whenever the ball went through the net, no matter which team scored, cheerleading everything and everybody. It was sometime in January when calls started flying from the stands. Sit down! Then came the booze. She didn't seem to notice. The Stargirl of the book seems to be unaffected by people's negative things they would hurl at her. As opposed to the movie where she seems a little more affected earlier on. As you can see, the book has this huge reason as to why things start to become a problem. Her cheerleading of both sides is huge. Now in the movie, that never happens. We don't really see her cheerlead both sides. She's a huge cheerleader and school spirit rah 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 for Team Micah High. Whereas in the book, it only becomes worse. The big incident happens at the end of the regular season before the playoffs. They're up 78 to 29 at the beginning of the fourth, but Stargirl went ahead and left early in the fourth quarter and never walked back in. And so the other cheerleaders end up asking her why she left, and she told them it was because she felt sorry for the other players. Unsurprisingly, the cheerleaders were not happy with that. The team wasn't happy with that. The fans weren't happy. In the movie, the major inciting incident that really starts her fall from grace seems to be centered around helping Kovac and going with Kovac off to the hospital. Now, that doesn't happen in the book. Kovac is there. He does get injured, but she doesn't go to the hospital with him. She actually comes back to continue cheering, and that's actually at the following game. Okay, two more things to really look at here. Let's talk about Hot Seat. So first off, Hot Seat in general. It's a very different hot seat. Hot seat in the book is huge. It's super popular. In fact, in Micah, it was often more popular than different nightly television shows for students. And if we think about the time period and the fact that it was 2000 in the book, this also helps make a little more sense compared to today. Think about the fact that Facebook wasn't created until 2004, YouTube in 2005, Twitter in 2006, etc., etc. I can keep going. The point is they didn't exist in the year 2000. So in other words, to really get yourself out there, this whole cool hot seat show actually was a good way to do it. And so these differences between the book and the movie make a lot of sense simply based on the time period they're set in. Whereas in the movie, we should note hot seat didn't seem like it was all that big. Kevin and Leo confirmed with Stargirl they were going to do an interview with her in mid-January and set it for February 13th, the day before Valentine's Day, because they wanted to really build it up. Well, that hot seat show turned nasty. That audience had it in for. Remember, this is the day after that basketball game incident that I talked about where Stargirl left. And it was ugly. Essentially, it had to go all the way until Mr. Robinow, who is in the book too, by the way, put a stop to it. And then it was never aired. But guess what? Everyone pretty much knew about it anyway, because word of mouth brought it everywhere. In the movie, we see the entire hot seat incident, and it ends with Stargirl dashing away in tears, which does not happen in the book. What kind of name is Stargirl? That does pop up too. Although it's very different in this case, because in the book, it's not just that she's named Stargirl, not like he, she just chose that one name. In the book, she has first called herself Pocket Mouse, then Mud Pie, then Hully Gully, and now Stargirl. So the name was not a super important thing. It was just something she was able to change from time to time. And, and that fits back into that non-conformity kind of piece that we have going heavily in the book. Now, frankly, I like this much better in the movie. I think it's much more powerful, the difference between Stargirl and Susan, when Stargirl means so much to her as a name. And before we finish talking about Stargirl's fall from grace for the time being, 
Let's talk about some more of the games. At this point, Stargirl's only cheering for Micah now after the hot seat incident that's changed her. She's subdued, which in the movie, she's certainly subdued after the whole event, but so much so that she seems to immediately change to Susan. That doesn't happen in the book. Again, things take time, but again, the book has the time to make that happen. And then the final game with Stargirl as a cheerleader is the last game of the basketball season for Micah, and they lose badly. But the incident that happens there is someone actually throws a tomato and hits her in the face with it. And there's a laughter amongst the other Micah fans in the audience, and even some applause. That's how far she's already starting to fall from grace, and how much uglier things can get in the book than the movie. The movie doesn't want to go that ugly. And I understand that. I mean, that also feels like it's partly the Disney side of it, not just not wanting to go that ugly. Okay, before we finish, let's talk about the relationship between Leo and Stargirl. There is no active relationship between them until middle of February. If we read between the lines, we can tell that Leo probably likes Stargirl, and that's probably affecting a bit of what is going on, but he's not even admitting that to himself at this point. Back in November, we see some of the first pieces, because she sings happy birthday to Hillary, but Hillary had made it clear that you better not sing it to me. So what she does is she sings happy birthday, Hillary, to Leo. And then Kevin asks her, why him? She goes, he's cute, and then tugs on Leo's ear. And this affects Leo in a big way. But nothing big happens for a while afterwards. So this echoes the piece in the movie where Stargirl comes right on over at the very beginning and sings happy birthday to Leo, although it's to Leo in the movie. In both cases, it's a clear indication that she does like Leo. And then we have to wait all the way until February 16th when Leo finds a Valentine's Day card that Stargirl had left in his notebook back on Valentine's Day and he just hadn't seen it till then. And he hems and haws as far as actually going out to talk to her. And eventually it turns nighttime before he actually goes there. So the conversation at the car happens then, as opposed to it happening during the day. Otherwise, the conversation at the car has a lot of similarities to it. This is definitely our introduction to cinema and yeah, it's pre pretty neat. So you can see a lot of differences in that relationship and how it starts up right off the bat. Unsurprising, again, mainly because of the timeline differences in how condensed the movie is versus the book. Then they have a day where they go out to the desert for the Enchanted Place, which we do see this in the movie as well. We do have the Enchanted Place and even some lines that are pretty close to directly out of the book about designating places as Enchanted Places. But intriguingly, in the movie, that location definitely looks kind of unique and interesting. It's a pretty neat little area. Whereas in the book, actually there is nothing special about the location. You could have gone ahead and gone 20 feet over that direction, or 20 feet the other direction, or 50 feet, and it would have looked fairly similar. But that's not what made it enchanted per se. It wasn't that it looked really unique and special. And while they're out there in the desert, she does talk to him about having stalked her. And yes, she uses those words, but spins it off largely as a bit of a joke in the end. And she apparently was aware the whole time. And in the book, by the way, it is a way longer time that he's following and stalking her there. In the movie, that conversation happens at the car instead of the book. But otherwise, there's pretty much a big similarity between the conversations. And one last thing about that desert. They also have a very similar meditation kind of idea going on between both the book and the movie. Even the talk about using the pink eraser to erase yourself to be able to get into that meditative state. That exists in both the book and the movie. Although she doesn't make it rain. It never rains while they're out there in the desert. But back to good cinematic qualities of the movie and what we can enjoy there. Okay, quite a few changes we just looked at here in part one. And that was only half the book. Wait until next time when I talk about the second half of the book compared to the movie. Which includes Susan, the dance, and more. Now, on these differences... I understand most of them. Most of them make clear sense. It's about having to fit something into two hours. That's what a lot of these changes come down to. A couple other changes have to do with shifting the tone. So now it's no longer about the nonconformity. It's about this magic and real idea in part, which didn't really exist in the book. Leo clearly saw her as real relatively early on. And then there's also the issues of it being set in 2020 versus 2000. So there's some intriguing changes and some things I definitely like better in the book and a bunch of things I like better in the movie. But what about you? What do you think? What was the biggest change or the one that surprised you the most in the first half here? Did you like it better in the book or the movie? 
let me know down below in the comments. And thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please, please give it a like and share it with your friends. I'll see you back here for another new episode of Freeform Disney tomorrow. And if you haven't done it yet, click the subscribe button and ring that bell. Have a magical day, and may the force be with you, always.